<coughs> so this week, we're moving on to the next step, which is hypothesis testing. And hypothesis testing is a process of choosing between two competing hypotheses. Of course, it's not nearly that easy. Um, the way we do it is we make an assumption. This assumption is called the null hypothesis, signified with H0. And the null hypothesis is the safe assumption. If we are looking at like drug testing, if we're testing a new drug against an accepted treatment that's been used for years, the old treatment is going to be the null hypothesis, that that old treatment is still the better treatment because it's safe. It's been used for years. We know it's effective. Uh, we know it's side effects and all that other stuff. If we <clears throat> keep going with that, if we, we, we choose that, that old drug, we're not going to cause any harm. Kind of the old uh, first do no harm type asset. <clears throat> so the null, null hypothesis is it will get kept unless we have strong evidence against it. Now, we never prove the null hypothesis. We only reject the null or fail to reject the null. So either we gather strong evidence against it to reject it, or we fail to gather strong evidence against. Of course, there's a null hypothesis. There's an alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis, which is labeled HA for alternative, some textbooks call it H1, so H0 and H1. Um, the alternative hypothesis must be true if the null hypothesis is false or is not true. So they have to be worded in such a way that either one is true or the other one's true. There's no gaps in between. <coughs> so let's look at how we, um, how we word these. The no, we'll go to a new page here. The null hypothesis is always worded as um, a population characteristic equals an hypothesized value. We use this null hypothesis. The reason it's always equals, <clears throat> even though we often do really mean greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, we always say equals because it is used to construct a hypothetical sampling distribution. So whatever that value is that we said that the, the population characteristic equals that hypothesized value, we take that hypothesized value and we create a sampling distribution about that value. The center of that sampling distribution is that hypothesized value from the null hypothesis. Now then, our alternative hypotheses can take on one of three forms. The first form 
would be that the population characteristic is not equal to that hypothesized value. So what's that mean? Well, we have this sampling distribution, this hypothetical sampling distribution with the value in the middle, that hypothesized value from the null hypothesis in the middle. <coughs> what this is saying is, is that the actual value is different from that one that's in the middle of the curve. To show that it's different, we could either get a sample data that's way down here, gives us a result way down here, or we get sample data that gives us a result way up here. So if we get sample data that's either too small or too large, we would reject. So that's why this is referred to as a two-tailed test. We would reject if we get sample results that are too far on either tail of the distribution. <coughs> we might have an alternative hypothesis. This is the population characteristic is less than the hypothesized value. So what this would mean, we've got our bell curve. Here's that hypothesized value from the null hypothesis. This is saying less than we would reject if we get sample data that's too far onto that lower tail. So this is a one-tailed test. It's considered to be a left tail or lower tail test. So it's on the left or lower tail of the curve. If our sample gives us results that's too far down on that tail, we would reject the null hypothesis again. <laughs> and then the third possibility <clears throat> is the population characteristic is greater than that hypothesized value. So in this case, we have that hypothesized value in the middle again. Now we'll reject if we get Sample data that gives us results too far up onto that upper tail. So this is still a one-tailed test. But now it is a right tail or upper tail test. Because we're going to reject if we get sample data too far up there. So to kind of review this process, we, we make our null hypothesis. Null hypothesis is always that the population characteristic equals some hypothesized value. That gives us this hypothetical sampling distribution. Then we create our alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is if there's something new we would like to prove. Remember, the, the null is always the safe bet, the status quo or an accepted value or, or somebody else's claim. The alternative is going to be the, the new riskier claim. <clears throat> but then we gather sample data. And if the sample data gives us a result, in this case for a two-tailed test, so it's too far out on either of those tails, that would tell us that uh, it's very unlikely that that null hypothesis is true. This is what we refer to, by the way, as the law of unlikely events. So if we have extremely unlikely events occur, we made an assumption about the sampling distribution. Then, we drew a sample, we gathered sample data. If the results of that sample data 
are extremely unlikely if the null hypothesis is true, then we reject the null hypothesis. If we, we made that assumption that the null hypothesis was true, but then we took our sample data, and if we get a result that's extremely unlikely based on the truth of the null hypothesis, then our only conclusion is that the null hypothesis was wrong. We have rejected that null hypothesis. <coughs> Let's look at some actual examples here. We're going to look at hypothesis tests for population proportion. These are always Z tests, by the way, although they are labeled as one proportion Z tests. We have a test statistic. A test statistic is basically a z-score. Um, in this case, it'd be p hat, which is the sample proportion, minus p, which is that hypothesized value from the null hypothesis for the population proportion, divided by our standard error of the means. It's the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n. <laughs> and then there's something called the p-value. The p-value is a measure of consistency between the assumptions in the null hypothesis and the sample results, the sample data. A low p-value means the sample results are very unlikely. High p-value means the sample results are consistent with the, the null hypothesis assumptions. <coughs> So we're going to look at um, an example the bookstore claims that a majority of students purchase ebooks rather than hard copies. A random sample. of 400 students gives 188 purchase ebooks. Test the bookstore's claim at alpha equals 0.05. <coughs> First of all, what's that alpha equals 0.05 mean? That is a level of significance. Very similar to the 95% confidence level in a confidence interval. What it is saying is that is our, our tolerance for risk. We're saying that 0.05 or 5% is what we're allowing is the maximum possibility that we reject the null hypothesis, but it's not based on real data. It's based on just accidentally randomly selecting a bad sample. So we're limiting that possibility to only 5% here. <clears throat> Let's create our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is going to be the bookstore's claim that that proportion is 0.5. A majority of students would be 50% or more. So they're really saying that the proportion is greater than or equal to 0.5. But remember, we always say just equal to in the null hypothesis. So if that's really greater than or equal to, the alternative is simply less than. So this is a one-tailed test. 
the null hypothesis sets up our sampling distribution with 0.5 in the middle. The alternative being less than, we're going to, if we get sample data that's way down on that lower end of the curve, we'll reject that null hypothesis. How do we know if to reject, when to reject it? We'll use the p-value in alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha of 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis. So let's check and see what our p-value and everything is. That means we're going to go to the calculator here. So we're going to go to stats, arrow over to tests. This is a z-test, but we want the one proportion z-test, option five. <coughs> Our hypothesized value of the proportion was a majority of students, that's 0.5. X is the number that bought ebooks, that's 188. Sample size N was 400. <clears throat> And then this is asking for the alternative hypothesis. And that is less than is our alternative hypothesis here. <coughs> we hit calculate, we get negative 1.2 for our test statistic and 0.1151, 1.1507, however you want to look at it, as our p-value. <clears throat> So our test statistic, Z equals negative 1.2. Now, if we think of this in terms of the empirical rule, one standard deviation is going to be somewhere in here. 1.2 standard deviation, negative 1.2 is somewhere in here. That's where the sample data lies. Negative 1.2 standard deviations below the mean. <clears throat> Our p-value is 0 0.11507. Now, if we compare that to alpha, alpha is 0 0.05. The p-value is not less than alpha. Since the p-value of 0 0.11507 is not less than alpha of 0 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. What that's saying is there is insufficient evidence to claim that less than 50% use ebooks. Now you'll notice the way this is worded here. This first statement, whether we reject or fail to reject, in this case, we failed to reject, is about the null hypothesis. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. Our conclusion, however, is worded about the alternative. There was insufficient evidence to claim that less than 50% used ebooks. That's the way it always gets worded in our conclusions to our tests. <coughs> Let's look at another example here. Um, let's say we have, once again, the bookstore claims that less than 80% of students have enough financial aid to purchase textbooks. A random sample of 350 students gives 299 purchase books on financial aid. Test the bookstore's claim at alpha equals 0 0.10. <clears throat> now we changed our alpha here just uh, to try a different value. <clears throat> 
So our null hypothesis, the bookstore's claim is that the proportion of students who use financial aid is less than 80%. So we're going to say 0.8. Notice we just say equals, even though we really, the, the bookstore claim is less than, we always say equals in the null hypothesis. So then the alternative is that, that proportion is greater than 80%. So again, we would have our curve. This is 80%. We're going to reject if we get sample data that's too large in this case. So that rejection rule would be we will reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha 0.10. So let's see what we get here. <coughs> So we're going to stat test one proportion z test again. Our hypothesized value is 0.8. Our x value here is 299 students. Um, sample size n was 350. The alternative this time is greater than. So we're going to select greater than there for our alternative, alternative hypothesis. Then we hit calculate. So 2.539 and 0 0.005. So we get a test statistic, Z, 2.539. What's that mean? Well, we would have one, two, three standard deviations would be you know, here there is almost nothing outside of it. 2.5 standard deviations. If it's not in that rejection region, it's got to be very close to it. I would say most likely it's in the rejection region. P-value. Of 0 0.00556. So our decision here since... The p-value of 0 0.00556 is less than alpha of 0 0.10. We will reject HO. So in this case, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that more than 80% of students are able to purchase books on financial aid. So there we did reject the null hypothesis. And so then our conclusion was to say, we, um, there is sufficient evidence to reject that and conclude that, that it's the other, it's more than 80% can buy their books. Now we'll notice back here, even though we failed to reject, we never said we accepted the null hypothesis. We are not gathering data in favor or to prove the null hypothesis. We're gathering data trying to reject it, trying to disprove it. And not really even disprove it, but to reject it, to strong evidence against it. So even, even though we, we don't get any evidence against it, we can never say that we accept the null hypothesis. We just failed to reject it because we're not trying to gather information in favor of it. Well, let's move on now to hypothesis testing. For population means. So when we're looking at this, we need to know first, do we know the population standard deviation? If we do, that is a z-test. Because we know the population standard deviation, we can use that along with um, the hypothesized value of the, the mean of the sampling distribution from the null hypothesis to create this bell curve, this normal distribution. If we don't know it, 
If we don't know the population standard deviation, then we're going to be using a t-test. Remember, the t-distribution um, takes into the account that we're using a sample standard deviation rather than the population, and it adjusts the width of that bell curve accordingly. Our test statistic, since we are looking at um, population mean here now rather than population proportion, <coughs> it's either going to be a Z statistic or a T statistic. It's going to be that sample value, Z. Um, X bar minus the population standard or population mean of mu divided by that standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size and the standard error of our means. Or if it's a T statistic, it would be a T here instead of a Z, and it would be using a sample standard deviation rather than a population standard deviation. Everything else looks the same. So let's look at some examples. So our first example, the average age nationwide of a college freshman. Is 22.8 years old with a standard deviation of 1.7 years. <coughs> so that 1.7 years is a population standard deviation. It's from the nationwide data. Our school wants to know if we are at the national average. A sample of, oh, where are we? 45 freshmen gives a mean age of 22.1 years. So test this at alpha equals 0.05. So our null hypothesis here is going to be that the mean age is equal to that national average of 22.8. The alternative is that, that mean age is not equal to that. So this will be a two-tailed test. Let's go ahead and plug our information in the calculator. So we'll clear this out. This is going to be stat test. This is just a Z test now, so it's option one. Now data would be if we had the all those 45 freshmen that we selected, if we had their ages in a list and we put them in a list in the calculator, that would be the data option here. Well, we didn't we don't have that data listed. We're just using the summary statistics from that sample. So we're going to use the, st the stats option. Our hypothesized mean is 22.8 years. That's from the national average. <coughs> the population standard deviation is 1.7 years. X bar is our sample mean, which is 22.1 years. Sample size, what was this, 45 freshmen? Yes. The alternative is not equal to, and we hit calculate. So we get a negative 2.762 with a p-value of 0 0.0057. <coughs> 
So our test statistic here, Z equals negative 2.762, which shows we're way out on the lower tail, the left tail. The p-value is going to tell us just how far out. It's got 0 0.0057. So since the p-value of 0 0.0057 is less than alpha of 0 0.05, we will reject HO. So in other words, there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that our students ages for incoming freshmen are different from the national average. Now you'll notice, um, even though the result we got was way down here, we got a really negative 2.762 is way down on that left tail. We can't say that the evidence supports that our students are younger because that was not our alternative hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis was just that they were not equal to the 22.8. So that's all we can do is accept that they're different from the 22.8 or different from the national average. We can't say that they're less younger or older or whatever. We can only say that they're different. So we, the, the null hypothesis we either reject it or fail to reject it. We never accept it. If we reject the null hypothesis, then we simply then um, take on support for the alternative as it is. We can't reword it in any way. <coughs> so our next example, um, let's say a company claims They pay starting wages better than the national average. So the national average for starting pay in that field is $18.20 per hour with a standard deviation of $2.14 per hour. A random sample of employee of how many employees do I want to take here? Now let's go 38 employees. Gives a mean starting pay of $18.02 per hour. <clears throat> so test the company's claim at alpha equals 0.05. Actually, let's do 0.02. Mix it up just a little bit here. So the null hypothesis is going to be the company's claim that their mean, I'm just going to use the capital U, is at or better than the national average of 1820. So the alternative would be that it's less than 1820. So if we get a p-value that's less than 0.02, we will reject HO. So let's find our test statistic and our p-value. <coughs> So this is going to be a z-test again. So stats, test, z-test. Our national or um, hypothesized value here from the null hypothesis is 1820. Um, the national standard deviation is $2.14. The sample mean was $18.02. 
Sample size was 38 employees. The alternative is going to be less than, or alternative hypothesis was less than here. We hit calculate. So we get a negative 0.519 or the p-value of 0 0.302. <coughs> so even though the sample gave us a value lower than the national average, $18.20. We use that national average of $18.20 to set up that curve, and we were going to reject if we got a value way down here. Unfortunately, what we got was a value somewhere in here. <clears throat> we have a test statistic. Z equals negative 0 0.519. So that's just below the, the mean, just below the center of the curve. The p-value is 0.3021. Three so here, since we have a p-value of 0 0.3021 is not less than alpha of 0 0.02, we fail to reject HL. So even though the sample mean gave us $18.02, which is less than the, the, the national average of 1820, there is not sufficient evidence to refute the company's claim. So we can't say that this sample is saying that they're wrong, they're lying. It definitely doesn't support their claim, but it is not strong enough evidence to say that they are incorrect. <coughs> Our next example. A university claims that students complete their degrees in less than five years. A random sample of 62 students, graduates I should say, they're not students anymore, gives a mean time to complete of 5.12 years with a standard deviation of 0.78 years. Test the university's claim at alpha equals 0.05. So the null hypothesis is that the mean is going to be less than or equal to five years. So we always put it as equal to for the null hypothesis. So the alternative would be that the mean is greater than five years. Our rejection rule is we will reject HO if the p-value is less than alpha, 0.05. So let's see what we get there for our test statistic and p-value. So stats, tests. Now this time we were not given a population standard deviation. We were given a sample standard deviation. So we have to use a t-test. <coughs> we're still using our summary statistics from our sample data. The hypothesized value of the mean, this is from the null hypothesis, is five years. The sample mean was 5.12. Sample standard deviation is 0.78 years. Sample size was 62 graduates. The alternative hypothesis here is going to be greater than. Now we select calculate. So we get T equals 1.211 with a p-value of 0.1152. 
So what's this telling us? So our test statistic, it's a T statistic instead of Z because this was a T distribution. Is 1.211 with a p-value of 0.1152. So even though our sample gave us a mean time to complete of more than five years, it's actually 5.12 years to be exact, there's a chance that that sample was just the result of random variation, random selection, and we happen to randomly select students who took longer. So even though it's greater than the five years claimed by the university, our sample is not strong enough for us to reject the null hypothesis. Since the p-value of 0.1152 is not less than alpha of 0.05, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that students take longer than five years. <coughs> well, let's take a look at one more example, then we'll move on from there. So in this example, bookstores making a claim again. Bookstore claims that students spend less than an average of $520 per semester on books. A random sample of 80 students gives a mean cost of books of $542. <coughs> With a standard deviation <coughs> of $97. We're going to test the bookstore's claim at alpha equals 0.10. <coughs> so our null hypothesis is going to be the bookstore's claim that that mean is 520 or less. We're just going to say the mean equals 520. So that means the alternative would be that the mean is greater than 520 we would reject HO if the p-value is less than alpha, in this case, 0.10. <coughs> so let's look at the calculator here. Okay, so we're gonna go to stat, tests, T tests again. The null hypothesis is $520. Sample mean is $542. Sample standard deviation was $97. Sample size was 80 students. The alternative is going to be greater than, it's already been selected. So we hit calculate. We get 2.028 and 0 0.0229. So we get a test statistic T, 2.028, 029 actually, with a p-value of 0 0.0229. So what that means, Since the p-value of 0 0.0229 is less than alpha of 0 0.10, we will reject the null hypothesis. In other words, there is sufficient evidence 
to support the claim that students spend more than $520 per semester on books. <laughs> so that is our different claims and different different types of tests. Let's talk before we move on to the mini tab part. Let's talk about errors. There are only two types of errors that can be made here. A type one error is where we reject the null hypothesis even though it is actually true. Now, we don't know whether it's true or not, because if we knew whether it was true or not, we wouldn't need to be testing it. Um, but <clears throat> we can occasionally reject the null hypothesis, even though it really is true. This is regulated by that alpha. For example, alpha 0.05, we had mentioned, is saying we are leaving a 0.05 chance that we reject the null hypothesis simply based on a random sample rather than on actually being a smaller value. So what's that mean? That means that the 0.05, that alpha is the chance that even if the null hypothesis is correct, that we could still randomly select a sample that gives us sample values that would cause us to reject the null hypothesis anyway. There's always going to be that small chance. Remember the bell, the sampling distribution looks like this. There's always chances of getting values way out on one of those tails. So no matter how correct the null hypothesis is, there, are, there, there exist samples out there that have those extreme sample values. And there's a chance that we could select one of them. It's a small chance, but it's there. <coughs> and that's how we set alpha. That's our tolerance to that. That's what alpha is usually 0.05, which means there's only a 5% chance that we're going to get one of those samples, even though the null hypothesis really was true. If it's something where it's not as critical, we might use a larger alpha. So yeah, we're gonna allow a larger chance of rejecting the null hypothesis simply based on random variation. Then there's a type two error. <clears throat> type two error is failing to reject HO even though it is actually false. Now, this is very common. Um, type two error is extremely common because the test is kind of set up in favor of the null hypothesis. Whatever we make that null hypothesis, that null assumption has a very strong chance of standing unless we gather really, really strong evidence against it. The whole test is stacked in favor of that null assumption or null hypothesis. So unless we gather that strong evidence, the null hypothesis is usually going to stand. I mean, we didn't prove it. We didn't support it. But we failed to reject it in many cases. So there, type 2 error is common. The system is set up in favor of type 2 errors because we would rather keep a faulty null hypothesis because it's the safe bet rather than make a change to something riskier without being absolutely sure. <clears throat> now there's stuff about the power of a test and the probability of that type two error. Um, we're not gonna get into that discussion in this course. It is in the textbook a little bit, but it's more on the, the more in-depth analysis side than what we're going to be getting in here. So let's take a look at mini tab. Mini tab, when it comes, first of all, for the next four weeks or so, um, anything in the application assignments that asks you to use mini tab, I am okay if you use either Excel or your, your TI calculator. 
I think the TI calculator does hypothesis testing way better than Minitab does, and it's way easier to interpret the results. Um, the only thing that Minitab does easier, I guess, than the calculator is um, importing in large data sets. For example, let's say that we uh, take scores of students who have submitted on an assignment. And there's those scores. There should be, what, 32 of them. If it were the calculator, if you have your cables, you can download data into the calculator. <clears throat> I'm using the data transfer cables. Um, or you can type it in, but 32 data points would be would take a while to type in. Now, just like last week with the confidence intervals, we're going to go to stat, basic statistics. And now we're going to assume that what we have here, um, that we know the standard deviation, the population standard deviation, equals 8. And we're going to do a null hypothesis that the mean is 80. The alternative is going to be the mean is less than 80. <clears throat> so we're saying that our students did 80% or better on this assignment. The alternative would be that they did not do that well. So we're going to stat basic statistics. One sample Z, since I did give you the population standard deviation there. So one or more samples each in a column. I'm just going to enter my scores as my data. Now, we didn't need the known standard deviation because I said this is a Z test. So I'll put that in as an eight. Now, if we were just doing a confidence interval, we'd leave it like this. So we go to our options and set their options. But we're going to perform a hypothesis test. So we have to check this box, which means we have to put in our hypothesized mean from the null hypothesis, which is going to be 80. <clears throat> now we do have to go to the options and set the alternative here to be less than is the alternative hypothesis. So we hit OK. And there it pops up our data, giving us a sample mean, standard deviation, and such. A p-value of 0 0.016, which is less than 0 0.05 of alpha. Remember, we used 95% here, which is alpha is 0 0.05. So this doesn't tell you the result. You have to interpret it. But a p-value of 0 0.016 is less than alpha of 0 0.05. So this would be rejecting the null hypothesis. The mean score was less than 80%. If I did not have the standard deviation there, we would have done stat, basic statistics. It would have been one sample t then. Still enter our scores. Our hypothesis value is it's still 80. Our options, it's going to be alpha's 0.05 or 95% level of significance. <coughs> the alternative is less than. And we hit OK. And we're going to get similar data. Our p value now is 0 0.07. Um, now that is not less than alpha of 0 0.05. So we failed to reject here, even though this mean is less than 80%. It's not far enough less for us to reject it. <clears throat> so that's where using the z-test, knowing that population standard deviation, allowed us to reject it. But without knowing it, we just missed rejecting. It's a 0 0.07. We needed to be 0 0.05 or below. Let's look at some categorical data here. So this is just yes or no, whether they passed an assessment or not. We do a null hypothesis saying that the proportion is 85% of them passed. So the alternative would be that that proportion is less than 85%. So let's do stat, basic statistics. This is going to be one proportion down here now. So we select pass rate. We are going to perform a hypothesis test. Hypothesis, hypothesized value of the proportion from the null hypothesis. 
is 0.85. Our options, well, our alternative is going to be less than. That's what we want. So we select that. And 95%, so we're still using a 0.05 for alpha. <coughs> Notice it gives us a p-value of 0.096. So we did not reject. That's not less than 0.05. We failed to reject the null hypothesis here. So that is really what um, Minitab can offer us here. See, it's not tremendously helpful, but it does analyze the data and give us a p-value. I think the calculator is way easier to enter the data and to analyze the result. With that, it is time for our meat quiz. <clears throat> So here we have <coughs> one college claims that the mean ACT score for freshmen entering their college is 27. The national standard deviation for ACT scores is 2.5. Our college wants to test the idea that our schools entering freshmen have a better ACT score. So we take a sample of 40 freshmen and we calculate a mean ACT score of 27.9. So we're going to test our hypothesis at 0.05. We're going to show our hypotheses, test statistic, p-value, and conclusion. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to set that up and work it, and then we will go over it. I always think the tough part of these is deciding what the alternative hypothesis should be. Of course, the null hypothesis is always straightforward. It's going to be that the mean equals the 27 from the other school. The alternative, <coughs> our school is saying that our students have a better ACT. So the alternative is going to be that the mean is greater than we're trying to show that our students did better. You can't assume that they did better unless we prove it. So let's go ahead and enter our information in the calculator here. So it's stats, tests. We do have a, a population standard deviation. It gave us that information about national scores, 2.5 standard deviation. So this is a z-test. <laughs> we are using summary statistics. Our hypothesized value is 27 from the null hypothesis. The standard deviation is 2.5. That's our population standard deviation. X bar, our sample value is 27.9. <clears throat> and our sample size was 40 incoming freshmen. The alternative, we want it to be greater than. And we hit calculate. So we get 2.27, 2.277, I should say, and a 0 0.0114 p value. <coughs> So we've got our hypotheses, our test statistic, 
z, because we did have the population standard deviation, is 2.277. Our p-value is 0 0.01140. So since the p-value of 0 0.01140 is less than alpha of 0 0.05, we will reject HO. That means there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that our incoming freshmen have a higher average ACT score. <coughs> well, that is it for this week. We'll cut this off here and go back to the main screen. Anybody have any questions?